So welcome once again for everyone joining us. Yes, nice you are introducing you. I think I'll take this chance to start to launch our webinar this morning. And in the meantime, more people are joining us for this very interesting talk today. So I start by saying good morning, good afternoon, or good evening and welcoming each one of you joining us from different parts of the globe. I am Luciana Pellegrino, president of WPO, and it's great to meet you again at, for a WPO webinar, and today with a very special guest, Adam Page, Global Director for Research and Re Reports at Smithers. Hi, Adam, nice to have you with us. Thank you. <laughs> Also very nice to have my colleague, Sohatala, Vice President for Marketing at WPO, that will support us today with the Q&A. So please, um, Soha, welcome. Nice to have you as well with us. Thank you, Luciana, and very happy to have Adam with us in this interesting webinar today. Yes. I'm sure we are going to have a very interesting conversation. And, and just to share a personal experience with you, since I joined the packaging industry 27 years ago, I followed Smithers' works and conferences and reports. So they are really thoughtful. They bring very interesting insights. So I'm happy about this collaboration and to promote this webinar together, bringing all of you some global trends in the, our packaging industry. But briefly, before we start, I would like to introduce WPO for the ones joining us for the first time. So very briefly about WPO in a nutshell. WPO is a global institutional body that represents the packaging industry on a global level. We gather as members packaging institutes and associations from 62 different countries around the globe to foster together packaging innovation, technology, sustainability, design, branding, user experience, packaging that saves food. There are so many aspects that we can foster packaging innovation to work on our mission that is to promote better quality of life through better packaging for more people. What we are focusing on, we are focusing on connecting the global packaging industry and build references and share knowledge for packaging's positive impact in our life in society. At the same time as WPO, we are searching to raise the voice for packaging and raise the voice for packaging in different conferences to share packaging contributions to more efficient supply chains and to bring quality of life and safety to society. How all of you can connect with WPO? We share content, references, and we promote connections and we invite each one of you to be part of it. So we promote packaging innovation through the renowned World Star Awards. It's the global award for our industry. By winning an award in your region that is recognized by WPO, you can run for this global award. And I take this opportunity to invite you to join us for this ceremony that will take place soon in Bangkok during Propec Asia show on June 15th. Please visit the, the, the website wordstar.org to see how you can subscribe for this global event and get to know the latest packaging innovation. Also, we invite you to visit our website and download different brochures and guidelines that you support your business. One that I call your attention is the Packaging Design for Recycling Guide, a very useful tool to support companies on designing for recycling. This guideline has been translated already to more than 13 languages and more are coming up. 
Also, we invite companies to join our global network as corporate partners of WPO. And last but not least, always stay tuned. Visit our website. We have a global calendar of events going on around the globe. We offer a newsletter and some news. And for sure, at social media, we are always sharing what is going on through WPO members or in our industry. And stay tuned for our next webinars. Always something coming up to share more information with all of you. And today, we are very happy to welcome Adam Page. Adam Page is Global Director of Research and Resports, uh, Reports for Smithers. Of course, Adam is going to introduce Smithers with us, but just to give you an introduction, Smithers provides world-class packaging expertise, supporting on strategic and business challenges with incisive market intelligence, consulting, and global references. With that, I will hand over to Adam and we are looking forward to our conversation today. Welcome, Adam. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Luciana. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, great to be invited to, to kind of give this talk. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so as mentioned, I'm going to give a high-level overview of the global packaging trends that we're seeing as part of our ongoing research into the global uh, packaging market. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction. As I say, I'm, my role is Director of Research and Reports, so I oversee a team of subject matter experts, consultants, and analysts producing around 50 market reports every year. We publish a lot in packaging as well as print paper, other related raw materials. Um, and we also offer custom market consultancy, um, again, leveraging that global network of experts uh, that we that we have um, uh, as part of the work that we do. And so as part of this, we're always looking at what is happening in the market. We're exploring the trends. We're quantifying the market, segmenting the market. So what I wanted to do is um, in this uh, webinar is give an overview of the trends we're seeing, give some high level market numbers, um, tell a bit of a story about what's uh, happening in this space. Um, as I mentioned, we do reports consultancy. You might also um, have seen some of the events that, that, that we do as well. Um, and uh, we also, uh, we do a lot of testing work around food contact testing, distribution testing. So um, you can see we're very much uh, part of the, uh, of the packaging industry um, with that deep expertise across all the different reports that we do um, and a lot of the uh, thought leadership and trends analysis that we do as well. So as part of the agenda, I've got a lot to pack in to uh, this webinar. So what I wanted to start with was a high level view of the uh, market outlook for packaging. And then once I've provided some of those headline market numbers, um, I'm going to dive into five specific mega trends that we are keeping an eye on. Those are consumer trends, sustainability, e-commerce, supply chain disruption, and then a bit about technology and innovation, because there's a huge amount that's happening in packaging at the moment. And then I'm going to look to wrap it all up and say, OK, what does this mean? Um, and what are the key takeaways from, from all of this research? So just to start with, um, just in terms of the overall packaging market, we're looking at now at a market that's worth more than a trillion dollars. And it's it's a highly resilient market. So if we look back over the last two decades, um, the story of uh, packaging has been one of a growth, uh, resilience. It's been a, um, while it's not a, a market that is often talked about compared to some of the high tech markets that, that we hear about in the news, it's, it's a market that always um, does well and performs well, uh, particularly uh, around um, crises that come along. So we can see here just from the data, um, while there was a kind of a small dip after the 2008-09 financial crisis, the market kind of got back on track as consumer spending returned. And again, what's fascinating in particular around uh, COVID was how there was this global pandemic, a huge amount of uncertainty, uh, a huge crisis that impacted millions around the world. Packaging was the hero in this story. 
Um, consumers realized that safe, reliable um, delivery of goods and services, essential goods like uh, food and drink and everyday consumer items uh, was what kind of kept things going. And packaging actually saw a uh, increase in, in the size of the market uh, immediately after that kind of COVID impact. Um, fascinating to see. Um, and as I say, consumers saw packaging in a new light and saw saw packaging as, as the hero. And I think this is a kind of a, a good story to remember kind of as we look ahead that um, packaging is that kind of reliable and resilient market that offers great investment opportunities across the board. And again, the other interesting thing about this chart, we can see that there are perhaps five or so kind of big, uh, broad um, packaging substrates in this market, and they all have a share, they all have a role. So later on, as we go through this talk, I'm going to talk about sustainability and, and lots of the other things that are happening. Um, but there's many niches within the packaging industry. They all have a role. They all have a replace. Um, and it's about the right material for, for the right application. Um, stepping back, if we look at the global market as a whole, we can see that Asia is the, the biggest region. Uh, a number of reasons. Um, as you can imagine, the market is uh, driven a lot by GDP, it's driven a lot by consumers and population size. And um, the market in Asia, in terms of population, obviously, it's it's going to be a, a kind of a bigger region than many others. There's also um, the rising middle class as well, um, demand for um, more sophisticated packaging. And all of that has led to a story um, particularly growth around China and India and other uh, um, developing and emerging and developed markets. Um, but there's definitely a shift and a focus um, looking at uh, Asia as a whole and um, the, uh, the kind of the, the growth that we're seeing in that region. Uh, in addition, we can see if we add up uh, Eastern and Western Europe, we've got a market broadly similar to North America. It's fascinating how European and uh, North American trends are broadly similar in a lot of respects. And I'll come on to this later when I talk about the regulatory landscape and, and some of the technology developments that we're seeing. Um, and I mentioned these broader um, packaging substrates. So in this chart, we can see the split by different um, substrates like flexible packaging, rigid plastics, uh, paper and board, metal and glass. Um, there's actually growth across the board in um, all these different substrates. So some will be growing a bit faster than others, but there's growth opportunities across the board. I think that's, again, is one of the, the key messages from the talk today is that it's not about as, as simple as paper versus plastic and one winning at the expense of the other. Um, the packaging industry, this this uh, trillion dollar market that we're looking at, is actually made up of many um, uh, niche markets and many individual areas, all with their own unique characteristics. And it's about choosing the right material for the right application. So there's many opportunities for packaging converters and suppliers to, to thrive and grow. Um, it's about identifying those right market opportunities um, and selecting the, the right technology and the right materials to make, to make the most of it. Um, if we dr drill down into rigid plastic packaging, uh, PET is the most commonly used material. Uh, this market is seeing good growth prospects over the next five years. Um, a number of reasons why PET in, in particular is doing well. One of them is the advanced recycling infrastructure that's in place. Um, certainly recycling is a big trend in uh, across the board in packaging, but particularly for plastic packaging. So recycling, but also as a material, it offers lightweight opportunities. Fascinatingly, there's increasingly this uh, uh, lightweighting that's going on, and we're seeing some bottles coming onto the market, and you think it would have reached the limit by now, but there's still even more that, that can be done. Um, there's also uh, shapes and 
um, brand differentiation opportunities available by shaping the bottles and um, uh, having kind of real shelf impact, which is one of the kind of key brand owner requirements uh, when they're choosing between the different um, uh, rigid plastic uh, polymers that are available on the market. Um, similar story in a way for flexible plastic packaging in that we have a particular polymer polyethylene that is doing very well and is likely to um, grow uh, faster uh, over the next five years. Um, this market for uh, inflexibles is really driven by the growth in monomaterial packaging. So there is a, um, a challenge around the recycling or a disposal of multi-material packaging. And multi-materials are needed for their uh, barrier properties and their performance. Um, but due to changes in the regulatory landscape, um, changing brand owner demands, um, there's now a shift from multi-layer to mono-materials. And a material like PE really benefits from that uh, because of its um, technical performance and uh, characteristics. Um, I wanted to drill down just quickly into this particular market. Molded fiber is an area where we've seen a huge amount of interest um, over the years, but particularly in the last year or so, um, we have done a, a lot of research in this space. It's a fascinating niche market. As I say, it doesn't really figure when we look at the size of the global packaging market, it's it's kind of relatively small. Um, our figures there show a market of just over kind of 10 million tons. And whilst um, many uh, people might think of egg boxes or kind of commodity, cheap commodity markets, um, there's a real uh, drive and uh, growth potential in many other emerging applications. Um, it's being also driven by the growth in e-commerce and the growth in requirements for protective packaging that is looking to replace or remove or take out the use of, of plastics in this space. Um, so this is definitely one for um, one to keep an eye on, one to watch. It's red hot right now. There's a, there's a lot that's uh, happening and there's a lot more to come. So that was a, a very headline overview on the market numbers. And so what I want to do now is talk a bit more about the story behind the numbers and a bit more on the why and um, what we see is, is kind of happening. So we look at the a number of what we call mega trends in this space. Uh, these mega trends are large, um, ongoing, uh, underlying trends and drivers that we're seeing in the global economy, we're seeing in terms of largely kind of consumer behavior, geopolitics, all of that is included in here. And we've identified six particular mega trends and we've analyzed the broad kind of impacts on these kind of five kind of major kind of packaging substrates. Um, what I, as I say, what I wanted to do is is kind of dive into these and, and kind of go through them in, in detail as, as, as part of this talk. But if I just kind of give a headline overview right now, unsurprisingly, you know, we see kind of sustainability is probably the biggest trend on the packaging market today. There's a huge amount that's going on in terms of the drive towards the circular economy. There's a lot that's happening in terms of technology, whether it's light weighting or replacement of materials. There's a bit of consumer behavior kind of wrapped up in this. And there's also um, a large number of brand and retailer commitments backed up with and supported by a changing regulatory landscape that are making probably some of the biggest changes that we're going to see in terms of packaging for, for decades. There's some real seismic kind of changes that are going on. Um, if we look, and I mentioned consumers, consumers still want fresh goods. They want it cheap. They want it fast. There is a trend that I'll come on to again in this talk later is around convenience and convenience being in conflict up to a degree with this drive towards sustainability. 
this is something that brands and uh, retailers are, are kind of wrestling with is that balance between what consumers are saying and what they want to pay for and how they're behaving with the necessary uh, requirements around circular economy and sustainability. Um, regulations, there's a big changing regulatory landscape and I'll give some examples. Um, PPWR is, is huge right now in Europe, but there is a similar raft of um, legislations in North America, in Asia, that's kind of moving around the world. Uh, E-commerce is linked to that um, trend towards convenience. Uh, I'll give some examples of that. There's a huge amount going on in technology and innovation. Um, there's packaging is a very innovative industry and packaging converters are always experimenting, always trying out new materials and technologies. Uh, innovative brands are driving forward changes because they understand that packaging is now part of the product and part of the marketing and can make a big difference in terms of shelf impact. And then last on the list, uh, supply chain disruption. That was huge during COVID, hugely uh, impactful in many negative ways, which is why that's so red across the board. Um, the big story here is around destocking, and I'll come on to that later on in my presentation. But if we start with consumers, uh, this is this is where it all, all kind of begins. Um, I mentioned um, growth in Asia, um, and we can just see here on this chart, looking at uh, world population, um, how uh, growth in population is ultimately one of the big drivers for the packaging industry but it's also within the uh within these populations the growing level of the middle class with higher disposable incomes who are willing and able to spend more on their their food their drink their household products and are looking for a kind of a better experience as well um there's also a uh, impact in terms of urban areas um, as cities grow and develop, there's going to be better waste collection rates and better recycling infrastructures. Um, convenience is huge. Um, in some respects, it's more important to consumers than sustainability. And brands and retailers are having to wrestle with this to come up with both products and the packaging that supports the products um, in order to... Uh, to be successful, to meet these sustainability requirements, but also uh, to continue to exist as a business to serve customers with ultimately what, what they're looking for. Um, this is something we, we're always going to see in terms of new products and new developments. So there's whole new markets that are emerging like food to go and new uh, products that are developing in, in grocery. There's other interesting areas. Um, looking at the growth in, in kind of pet food and the spend that's going on there and convenience in just in terms of um, easy opening, reclosability, lots of uh, cool technologies that are um, adding more value to the consumer that consumers are, are then kind of willing to pay for. Uh, and all this has to be balanced with sustainability, as I mentioned. Um, there is a paper versus plastic um, uh trend that, that's kind of happening broadly consumers do have an anti-plastic sentiment and surveys repeatedly show that consumers prefer alternatives um, this is backed out with the uh, evidence um, multiple surveys um, lots of research kind of backing this up um, but again it's not as simple as this um, there is a need and a requirement for plastics in certain key applications and actually plastics did very well in terms of um, uh, from covid it showed that uh, it was the hero because it could provide safe hygienic uh, convenient uh, food and, and and goods at a, at a time of a crisis so it's easy to look at this data and make a high level assumption that uh, paper will, will replace plastic but actually the um the situation is far far more nuanced and it depends on the specific applications um consumers are 
also um, largely in in these kind of single person households, which are uh, which are growing. It's driving demand for um, different uh, portion sizes, different packs, growth in ready meals um, uh, that we've seen a lot, uh, growth in re uh, reclosable, microwavable packaging. So it's worth looking at these trends in order to uh, figure out suitable technologies and uh, appropriate, uh, appropriate packaging for the markets that we're serving. Um, and I mentioned this uh, drive towards convenience. Consumers on the one hand want uh, sustainable packaging and that's kind of table stakes. They also increasingly want an effortless experience to get what they want um, at the right price. This is leading to obviously growth in the giants like Amazon, but it's also leading to startups and innovation around fast delivery services, particularly in metropolitan areas. So there's been a huge investment in these fast delivery apps and services. However, there are challenges to get this business model working. And only recently, uh, we've seen one of the big startups in this space pulling out of the UK market because the business model wasn't quite right. So this is what consumers want. Businesses are trying to serve this need. It's going to have an impact on packaging but more effort needed to get the, the business model right. So that was consumer trends. I mentioned and touched upon sustainability. This is the big trend in packaging right now. Um, so we define this um, and we have, have a, a kind of a longer description here, um, but this is this kind of Smithers definition. Um, we think of its packaging that uses raw materials that are technically recyclable, widely recycled and used in a packaging format that's widely collected. Um, there's also a few other uh, tweaks and changes here because it's not a surprise that if you ask uh, five different people what's sustainable packaging, you're, you're going to get kind of five different answers. But this is this is the, the definition that, that, that we use. Um, brands have made a number of large scale, um, ambitious sustainability targets um, these are collected by uh, groups like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. These are, are publicly announced. Um, there's, these are sincere and there is backing and investment for these goals. What we're seeing now is that these targets are really coming under pressure. So very recently, for example, uh, Unilever uh, made, a, uh, made a change and they um, changed one of their one of the goals from 50% virgin plastic reduction by 2025 to one third virgin plastic reduction by 2026. It's not a surprise in a way because these goals are so ambitious. Um, they are, as I say, sincere, and there is a lot of investment that's going on, and we'll we'll have to see how the other brands will respond to this. Um, I think there will be um, seismic changes in terms of packaging related to these goals, but maybe we'll see more brands tweak, refine, and in some cases compromise their um, targets based on the reality of the technology and the market and the business models that need to be in place. And as I say, one of the reasons for this is because there is no easy solution. There's no silver bullet. Um, so there's all of these um, forces are coming together. Um, sustainability is, is top of the agenda. But for example, um, there is a drive to increase the use of recyclable content and post-consumer recycled content. Um, brands want this material. They want to incorporate it into their packaging. There just isn't enough material available that's coming out of the waste stream at the end of the value chain. There isn't enough of this material um, for these brands to be able to, to achieve their goals. So there's huge pressure on the packaging and recycle value chain to invest, to create uh, the infrastructure that can give this a uh, raw material for that the, uh, the brands are craving. Um, some crazy things happening in terms of economics, where in some cases virgin material is now cheaper than recycled content because there's such a demand for this uh, recycled content. 
Now, the brands have to navigate a complex uh, legisl legislative uh, framework as well. So I mentioned uh, PPWR. That's big in the news. Uh, that's been voted on uh, and is coming into force. PPWR is just one part of a much bigger framework that brands have to um, understand and have to incorporate into their thinking. And this uh, diagram here, this is just for Europe. There's similar frameworks for in the US. There's even more complicated frameworks for Asia where you have all these different countries and all these different um, uh, pieces of, of regulation that need to be navigated. This really is top of mind for many companies across the packaging value chain is just understanding this and incorporating the thinking and thinking through the impact on both suppliers, their competitors, their customers as well. So there's a lot of work uh, here uh, to really kind of understand the impact of this. Um, extended producer responsibilities coming in. Um, I'll, I'll kind of glance over this, but I, I wanted to kind of raise it because um, this is going to be another complex part of the packaging value chain now and in, in the years to come. And I mentioned, for example, Asia. Uh, this is a piece of research that we did looking at um, a, a basket of countries, a list of countries in Asia, the current situation for EPW, EPR, uh, whether it's in place and enforced or in place not yet enforced and the legal frameworks. And we can see just at a glance um, that this is a complex and also kind of moving and evolving kind of landscape. So global brands are really spending a lot of time and effort to really uh, understand this and understand the impact that it's going to have on their supply chain and ultimately getting the materials and technologies they mean they need to, to package their products. Um, so e-commerce, uh, next on the list, I mentioned convenience. Um, I mean, e-commerce boomed during COVID. Um, this is a story that many of us experienced when we were perhaps stuck at home and with very few uh, retail options available. This really changed consumer behavior. And since COVID, um, we've seen these consumer trends and consumer behaviors continue, have, well, have, have permanently changed now. So consumers are now um, very familiar with uh, ordering online. Um, the market really boomed for e-commerce. The growth is now not as fast, but it's still growing. And there's many opportunities in this space, specifically for packaging. Um, brands and retailers are wrestling with omni-channel, different ways of, of reaching consumers, uh, very fast consumer or changes in consumer behavior. Um, but just looking at the um, looking at the data, I mean, it's uh, it's it's a it's a fast growing market with a, a lot happening in terms of technology, new products, adapting to consumer behavior. Um, this is all what the uh, the brands and retailers are having to wrestle with right now. Uh, when we sized the market, we saw a lot uh, happening in terms of uh, corrugated boxes with a smaller part around flexible packaging and uh Ecom mailing bags. Um, there's also uh, a lot that's happening around protective packaging as well. So there are um, there's a lot of work going on to uh, right size boxes. There's a lot that's going on to um, and it's being enforced as well to reduce the amount of kind of wasted space. So this is driving a lot of automation, automation, a lot of digitization. Um, there's a lot of data on customers and customer behavior that is feeding into this. So this e-commerce space is really going to change a lot as that data, more and more data comes in from consumer behavior and the uh, key players adapt to some of the changes that are coming through on the re regulatory side and on the reducing waste side. Um, supply chain disruption. Um, now, destocking was a bit of a buzzword, um, particularly last year. So the story here is that during COVID, 
there was a bit of a panic and a bit of a scramble to secure packaging. There was a big concern that the packaging would not be available and the brands and the uh, retailers purchased as much inventory as they could get. And this is one of the drivers for why we saw particularly that kind of increase in, in, in the size of the market. Now, as the panic subsided, these businesses went through a process of destocking. They burnt through the inventory that they had bought during that uh, time of, of, of panic. This then triggered a decline in demand. The growth wasn't there as expected. Actually, if you look at the figures, a lot of companies struggled in 2023 at a time when the recession didn't happen as predicted and the economy looked good. And on the surface, um, consumers were outspending, but packaging businesses were struggling. Big question mark about how long that was going to last. Um, and we can just, just see at a glance at this data um, that it took a while to then kind of play through, but we're now pretty much back on track. And if we look at the most recent data, we can kind of see supply chains are getting back to a degree of normality. Um, that normal is, is a hard word to define because there's other crises. There's the Red Sea crisis. There's transportation costs. Um, there's a, a number of issues that are still there in the supply chain. Um, but this destocking now looks like it's kind of played its way through and we're getting back to what we would think of as, as a, a as a less volatile uh, market. Uh, last on my list of mega trends um, is around technology and innovation. So there's a, a lot happening I uh, mentioned in terms of e-commerce packaging. Um, so we have EPS and foil insulation bags that uh, brands are looking to replace with fiber-based packaging alternatives. So these are using renewable raw materials. They're more easily recycled at home. Um, uh, insulation materials are kind of uh, dual purpose. So there's technologies that are available that are both protective and offer these kind of insulation qualities. Um, I think we're gonna see a lot more of this innovation happening in terms of e-commerce packaging, in terms of both the unboxing experience and customer delight when unwrapping at home. But also, I, I mentioned earlier, the kind of omni-channel and changes that we're seeing to the supply chain and brands not being so sure about how their packaging is going to reach the consumer and will, will it go through traditional retail channel or via e-commerce. And brands are designing the packaging that can survive and thrive in, in all these different environments. There's a lot happening with smart packaging or connected packaging. Um, we've seen a resurgence in the use of QR codes. Um, consumers are more digitally savvy than ever before, um, particularly as a result of um, COVID and, and becoming familiar with ordering online and everything else. So packaging that connects digitally or drives engagement or tells a bit of a story is a hot topic. And there's lots of examples of brands kind of experimenting with this. And there's a lot that's going on around uh, paper-based packaging and a bit of a holy grail is, is this kind of high barrier, easily recyclable, mono material, kind of paper or fiber based packaging. That's a bit of a bit of a holy grail, bit of a bit of um uh oh well, a lot of investment kind of happening in that area. Um I've got some interesting examples here on the left um looking at confectionery. I think confectionery is one of the areas where we've seen the fastest shift from plastic to paper. I think it's because of the category and the demands in that category and combining that with uh, consumer preferences and consumer feedback as well. Um, we also saw recently a lot going on in terms of paper bottles. Um, 
there have been some interesting uh, launches in this space. The technology is there. There's a bit of uh, a buzz and excitement, and we've seen some big names uh, announcing kind of trials and things like that. It's still on the surface at the moment looks like um, kind of a niche, niche application. Um, it doesn't look like it's going to uh, completely displace uh, traditional kind of bottle technologies, whether that's uh, plastic or glass. But I think, again, it just gives a flavor for what's on the horizon and the types of technologies and innovations that uh, brands are working on in partnership with either uh, startups or, or established packaging converters. Um, I mentioned EPR earlier. Uh, this is driving uh, the use of um, improved recyclability. So we're seeing um, in uh, uh, the home care sector in laundry, we're seeing growth in recyclable monomaterial PE uh, refillable pouches. And also we've all seen um, tether coat closures for soft drinks and PG bottles. So, so we're seeing these technologies and innovations emerging really driven by those trends that I mentioned around sustainability and that regulatory landscape, combining that with consumer convenience and getting that balance right. A um, lot going on in waste and recycling. Um, digitization has a role here. Um, there's a fascinating project called Holy Grail that's um, all to do with the watermarking and tracking and tracing of these raw materials so that they can move through the supply chain, they can be identified, they can be quickly sorted. And again, it comes around and produces ultimately enough of the raw materials, whether it's PCR or other raw materials that the brands are craving um, because they want to get that recycled content into their packaging. So this is a, a big project. Um, we can see a list of the backers on the right hand side of the screen. There's some big names in this area. Um, that's one of the one of the big challenges that the packaging industry as a whole is working with. And then my last technology example um, before I kind of conclude the webinar, we did some research on AI and how AI is likely to transform packaging by 2030. I mean, this was without doubt one of the biggest um, uh, buzzwords or hot topics that we've seen for a long while. Uh, we've all seen it in the news. We've probably all had a go on chat GPT just to see how that looks. We've, we're kind of hearing more and more announcements about what's happening. So we did a deeper dive into this and identified five specific areas where we could see uh, generative AI having an impact on packaging over the next five years. Um, brand design, looking at performance and usage, supply chain optimization, conversational engines and enhanced R&D. Um, just a very quick overview. When we started looking at it, we thought, wow, well, brand design looks like it would be you know one of the kind of early adopters or or that's kind of something a bit obvious is is perhaps kind of experimenting with designs and so on i think that is a role for it kind of somewhere in the future uh, but actually the more interesting examples when we really kind of looked at this is more around kind of analyzing performance and supply chain optimization um, there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes um, around securing of materials, around contracts and contract negotiation, around gathering data to understand the, um, the supply chain and how it works and using that to better forecast um, supply of materials um, and to kind of mitigate disruptions. Um, this, this is something that a number of companies that we've spoken to are actively investing in, actively working on and starting to see results. Um, combining that with maybe a conversational engines. Um, so for example, Walmart using chatbot type technology to negotiate with hundreds of suppliers at a time. And how about AI for an enhanced R&D to 
develop new biodegradable materials or to speed up the make, test and decide cycle. Um, these are all actively uh, being implemented in research right now. Um, so overall, we're going to we're going to see further huge changes uh, to packaging over the next uh, certainly over the next five years and beyond. So that was, as I say, my overview of the market uh, covering those five main mega trends. Um, so just a quick recap. Um, I mentioned sustainability is the number one trend. It's not a passing trend. This is, it's um, it's real, it's here to stay. Whilst the brand owners and retailers have set these challenging goals and there is a small degree of compromise, they're not gonna go away. Um, they are, uh, sustainability is driving purchasing decisions and to survive packaging converters and suppliers need to, need to adapt. There's combining that with consumer life cycles and, and, and consumer trends and that need for convenience. Um, there is a tightening regulatory landscape. PBWR is sending shockwaves through the industry. Many companies are just grappling with what this means. EPR is part of that. And that is a, a complex piece that is going to influence uh, packaging over, over the next five years. And then we have areas like e-commerce that are still growing, not as fast as it was before, but there's still a lot that's happening. And brands are in this omni-channel world where they don't know is, is their packaging going to go th through the traditional e-commerce travel or is it going to go bricks and mortar to the the traditional retailer and they're having to design packaging that can survive all these different routes to market. But overall, packaging suppliers and converters are responding to these challenges. There's more innovation than ever before. And just to go back to my first slide, we're in a resilient growth industry with a huge amount of opportunity and a huge amount of, um, of potential across the board in all these different substrates, in all these different end use markets um, and globally as well. So yeah, thanks very much. Um, hope that was good and happy to move on to a Q&A session. Thank you, Adam, for this interesting overview and to give us uh, all these interesting data on the growth of the packaging industry around the uh, continents and we can see Asia is really on the move and also for the interesting uh, uh, global trends that you have uh, overviewed. We have seen regarding sustainability, uh, allow me to say it's it's not a trend anymore. It's like a legislation. It's mandatory. Mm -hmm. So we, they, we don't have a choice not to follow it, especially with the upcoming PPWR that you have mentioned. So it's not a luxurious option anymore. Uh, all the brands are really obliged uh, uh, to have it. So uh, we didn't stop you because it was really, really interesting, but we really have little time left for question and answer uh, around 10 minutes. So I will jump into some question uh, that were asked. Uh, Patrick was asking if you have any uh, data uh, for the recycling rate per material. And this is really a question that many people ask me that, okay, consumers are happy to see that this material is recycled or recyclable and all of this, but they want to know at the end of the day, what are the rate of recycling? Uh, as a smither, do you have this kind of data or are you interested to go there? Yeah, so yeah, it's a great question. And there is a difference between packaging that's technically recyclable and actually recycled, and there's differences between the two. Um, there is data that is available. It's better in Europe and North America. It's it's patchy data when we start looking kind of more globally. Um, there is data available, and um, as I say, we, we cover it in our reports. Um, but there's also a um, more work is needed to kind of really measure this as well. So this is part of the investments that is going on in terms of recycling technologies, whether it's chemical recycling and mechanical recycling is kind of collecting the data and where does this go and where does this end up? And I think the data that is available 
that is published isn't quite giving the industry the granularity and the visibility that it needs. Um, so as as I say, we can I, we can find I, data I, on Europe and North America, but it doesn't have the granularity that the industry needs. Again, that that's why that Holy Grail project is kind of happening to you know can you get better data by tracking the products as it goes through um and and the product itself is producing kind of data at the end um so that's a very very big question and very uh, a very hot uh, hot topic right now yeah. even in the middle east region because i come from the middle east and here i think that we really need to have like a joint forces between the private and the public sector because there's a investment that should be done from the public sector as well to increase the recycling uh, station and to increase mm. the way management and all of this sort of thing because okay we are happy that these materials are recycled and re are recyclable but we want to really be sure that at the end of the day there's somebody who is collecting them and i think that's why we have the epr the extended producer responsibility mm. yesterday uh, nestle was posting uh, something along what you said that uh, they have this promise to have their uh, all their pro packaging recyclable by 2030. And I went to the comment, you cannot see the people, how they start asking them a lot of questions. Among this, how can we be sure about the recycling rate? Uh, why don't you minimize the packaging uh, and all of this? Let me take another question. Um, also, uh, Patrick is asking, who is uh, checking on the brand owner's pledges? Uh, are they monitored and independently published, penalized? Uh, you can answer. Uh, yeah, so, so there are some, some some very good bodies. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is one. Um, so at the moment, the brands are uh, publishing this themselves and auditing this themselves. I think the regulations are tightening that they are now going to be after a period of time going to be it's going to be more enforced and there will be a lot more work and investment going on into auditing and checking what's what's kind of happening so these things need to kind of happen uh jointly but that is on the horizon and that is what the industry is preparing for right now is one day exactly. you will need to prove or show how how much was recycled and where it went and 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 that is causing a degree of concern, but that's the direction of travel is uh, collecting that insight and data because it will become mandatory and it could become a um, regulatory requirement to do so. It is becoming because, as you know, besides the PPWR, we have now a new European legislation that will be out soon on green claims in order to avoid green washing. So mm. also. Uh, Producer have to really prove uh, what they are putting on the labels regarding uh, sustainability and all of this. There's another question uh, from Anshita. And allow me also to comment uh, before giving the floor, because she is saying, apart from plastic, which packaging material is causing environmental issues? Uh, here as the WPO, uh, we always say that we are an organization that is material neutral. And this kind of uh, blaming always the plastic as the BPO, we don't like it. And here I can see that the consumer, and I don't know if uh, this person is a packaging professional or not, we cannot judge the packaging or environmental impact only from seeing if it's plastic or not. And I think that here, all of us measure the BPO and many organizations, we have a role to play to increase awareness because Sometimes, especially now, plastic and the mono material, uh, the recycling rate is even better when seeing a paper with a uh, liner of plastic because you cannot remove it. So that's why really we need to uh, have a holistic approach. This is my mm. answer to you. And now I, I will allow Adam to add. Yeah, well, so, so, so we respect that approach. We have a similar approach as well. We are independent and neutral and, and objective. And... You know, the facts are, in some areas, PET bottles are widely recycled because there has been the investment in the infrastructure. So it's not just the packaging by itself. There is consumer behavior. 
there is the behavior of 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 the business and the packaging industry and then there is the supporting infrastructure for for a truly circular economy to to happen there needs to be investment across the board and there's a debate about whether that is private or public or is that the government or is that the industry or is that someone else um but it's never just the packaging by itself um there's lots of examples where uh, light weighting um has created a better economic uh, environmental impact compared to a heavier material but the heavier material may be more widely recycled so it depends in some cases can kind of exactly how you measure it um where you, and that's where you need the science and the data to come to a rational logical fact-based decision yeah if i can and now more it, questions are coming Yes, just, just quickly, Soha, because this is a very nice topic and important one to discuss among packaging professionals. And I see that as a responsibility, it's time that the industry take the leadership and, and the protagonism to push a greater, greater waste management programs and greater waste management infrastructure, not only for recycling, but also to, to avoid littering to avoid pollution as well. So how can we call governments, how we can call the, the public sector to support on this? And mm. at the same time, how can we engage consumers? How can we teach them? It was so interesting that Adam shared that consumers value more convenience than sustainability. So we need to engage consumers on sustainable consumption otherwise we are always going to be running after this packaging management so it is not about appointing one material or another but about us pushing the solutions being part of the solution and building it as well right that's a great yeah. point and and just it reminds me in the past food waste was the enemy food waste was bad uh, packaging was the hero because plastic packaging, for example, then prevented uh, large-scale food waste. Now the conversation has shifted. Uh, plastic has a very negative perception. There's lots of negative things, but in the holistically, in the whole, you have to look at okay, if we replace a very good barrier, cheap barrier material with something else, that's likely potentially to increase food waste on, on the other side. So which option do you prefer? What, what are your ultimate values or, or what's the ultimate objective? And then, as I mentioned in the presentation, it's about the right packaging material for the right application in the right geography with the right infrastructure and the right recycling and, and everything else. Yeah. I will take two more questions. Uh, also, another question is asking on the bio-based packaging material. Uh, do you also have any data on the prospect uh, and the future for this, for, especially for the food industry? Yes, I do. I actually uh, took that bit out because I felt my slide deck was slightly too long, which uh, it turned out to be. But uh, um, yeah, there's a lot that's going on in a kind of bio-based. Um, it was, again, a few years ago, the buzz was around compostable packaging biodegradable and compostable packaging that didn't really resonate with consumers and that was a bit of a confusing message um so now it's kind of moved back to could you know could bioplastics uh replace traditional plastics with the exact same uh technical performance but just from a different kind of feedstock um yeah there's a lot that's happening and and, and that area is, is is kind of growing Perfect. I will take one last question from our colleague Ahmad Omar, the president of the African Packaging Organization, and he's our WPO ambassador. Happy to have you with us, Ahmad. Mm -hmm. So Ahmad is uh, referring to your slides when you were talking that now the, conf uh, the confectionery uh, uh, field is using a lot of paper instead of plastic. So he's asking you, when this plastic, there's a liner that it's coated, if paper is coated with plastic, which kind of category it falls. Sometimes we call it hybrid, but I will ask you, I will let you answer this question. Yeah, so um, if there's a coating, then we would put it, we would put the market into, we would put that into paper. Paper, but with a coating would still for us be, be kind of paper. If it's, if it is um, a kind of a multi-material, 
uh, we would then kind of separate it out and put like the foil into metal and, and the plastic part into plastic. Um, but that's right. still the challenge is something that is 100 percent paper based. It's uh, recyclable. It's kind of high barrier. That's that's still a kind of a real challenge so for in the your industry. Data and the, so in your data and report, you still consider it paper, even though there's yeah. a OK. But I yes. think. If you allow me to answer, I think you cannot consider paper anymore because, as I said, when uh, when you are adding another material, we call it hybrid because you are adding a strain on the recycling rate. Because how are we sure that the consumer, before uh, putting it in the trash or littering it, is removing this liner? Because I prefer and I suggest to separate them because you cannot comp compare a um, packaging that is made from 100% paper was another one paper with a liner because it will add a lot of strain and the fast food industry are using this a lot to attract the consumer that they are using and this is really a kind of misleading the consumer because they see the bowl of salad paper mm. they think it's good for the environment but you come to see that there's a liner of plastic so so I don't know. My, my if it was advice... if it's if in terms of measuring it as tonnage, if there's a separate liner, then the tonnage of the the uh, liner that's plastic would go into plastic, and the outer paper would would go into kind of the paper category. If they are separate, then they they would fall into the two different categories. If it was paper that had a coating, uh, we would just include that as a um, put that into paper. Yeah, in, in different regions, there are different technologies in place that some may recycle them as they are with into a top of 5% of plastic in other regions, perhaps not. But what we have seen recently at visiting a Nuga Food Tech where WPO had the booth, uh, we saw uh, the possibility already uh, to, to separate the, the liner, the plastic liner from the paper, targeting this recyclability. So technology is there to make it even those mm. solutions more recycle ready. And it's it's important to then to bring the right directions to consumers so that they know how to dispose of that packaging or how to handle it before they dispose of it as well. I think well, we, we have needed our time, but people are really uh, now excited and asking more questions. And this is a sign that maybe, Adam, we need to have an, an additional webinar well. soon. To discuss yeah. all of this. Uh, so, Luciana, maybe you will have a concluding remark before giving Adam. Yeah, a so fact. thank you so much, Adam, for this comprehensive pre presentation. I mean, it is so interesting to see how many dimensions there are that challenge our industry, but at the same time bring a lot of opportunity to our industry. So, and, and I mean, it was clear today that even us that are working in this field for so many years, still we have different perspectives. So we have to get together to exchange uh, knowledge, to exchange perspectives so that we can support ourselves to move forward and support the innovation in our industry and a greater positive impact, impact of packaging in our life and society. This was a very nice opportunity uh, to to collaborate with meters and we expect to uh, to increase our collaboration and who knows in the future bring some news to all of you on how we can bring more uh, specific data to our global packaging market so i hand over to adam for final remarks i thank you all for joining us Please stay tuned, follow WPO on social media, follow WPO in our website to get to know the new webinars that are coming up and new activities as well. And also thank you for your encouraging comments on the chat. Adam, I think you, you have seen them. People mm -hmm. really appreciated your presentation and we are ha really happy about it. So thank you, Soha, to for your support. Yes. Thank you. Well, before jumping to uh, to Adam, I just want to answer people because many are asking if there will be a recorded uh, session. Yes. Uh, we can uh, please stay tuned on our YouTube channel. We will be posting the recorded session soon. So, and I thank everybody really. And I'm sorry mm. I couldn't cater the need of all the answer, but soon. Uh, we will keep in touch. Thank you, Adam. The floor is yours. Yes. To talk to.
thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it, it was great to have the honor to to present. Uh, I'd love to explore maybe coming back another time to to do a follow up. Yes, thank you. So thank yeah. you and see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.